at that loss. Um, and um, schools are likely to need about three billion uh, pounds in savings to be found by 2020. Again, just to kind of contextualise that um, at a local level so that you would understand the impact that it has on particular schools. Uh, for the school that I work in, uh, we've had to find cuts of 1.5 million in two years just to try and sustain the daily education of the students in our care. So it is a real significant issue uh, for schools. As I've already said, there's un uncertainty now over the national funding formula. It was supposed to kick in in 2019. One of the things that's already come through um, the, uh, the election manifestos is the fact that that might be deferred again, which creates more uncertainty for schools. Tash, quick question. Yes, of course, yeah. I hate people telling me that they're going to need to save three billion pounds. In the context of what? Is your budget four million pounds or is it 40 million pounds? In it, and you talk about you know, your school. Of yeah, okay, so that, yeah, that's why I thought I'd context. mention my schools, give you a context. Yeah, in the yeah. context of your school, you've got to save a million and a half. Well, what's your budget? Uh, it's gone from about six and a half million down to five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's a significant cut. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. <coughs> Can, Can I ask, ask another question, which is, um, you talked about um, teacher workload. Yeah. <coughs> and I wonder which was the more more um, expensive, if you like, mm. for a teacher to work on their own, as I did many yeah. many, many many years ago, um, or for a teacher to have lots of teaching assistants who they directed to do work mm. for them. Mm. Which which do you think is the, the most Cost effective yes. or, or the one that's going to impact <coughs> most on uh, education? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, both. both. Um, in, in terms of teaching assistants, uh, there's been an awful lot of work done around teaching assistants, an awful lot of research um, which gives teaching assistants quite bad press at the moment. So the Education Endowment Agency did an awful lot of work um, around the value that teaching assistants offer to the classroom and it came out quite poorly. However, that was just one way of looking at teaching assistants and one particular set of uh, kind of meta-analysis. Um, teaching assistants are very effective. The issue uh, with teaching assistants is if you employ them, you now have to employ them at the cost of teachers in essence because there's such little funding for special educational needs. Um, and that's normally the pot that we would draw from to, to buy teaching assistance. So because that pot has shrunk so much, schools will now need to justify themselves after they've purchased the amount of teaching assistance that they would need to, to deliver to students who have education healthcare plans. They would need to make a decision about whether to get teaching assistants that are more economical than teachers to offer more value in the classroom or to get teachers and you have to make those particular choices. In terms of what works best, what works best is highly skilled teaching assistants that do more than just support in the classroom. That's the model that is the most effective um, and the model that many schools would be starting to use. So teaching assistants would be employed and would be skilled up within the institution to do things like small teaching, unqualified teaching work with small groups of students, working with um, students who are trying to catch up to a certain level in the curriculum because it's so hard, it's not even the, the, the money side of it, it's so hard to recruit strong teachers that you need to find creative ways to ensure that everybody's getting provision at a, an appropriate level. If we look at maths, for example, it is nearly impossible for schools to be fully staffed with fully uh, qualified uh, maths teachers with the appropriate level of subject knowledge. But if, however, you have a, a highly skilled teaching assistant who is able to take um, a lower ability group in maths and to diffuse the pressure, on the curriculum so that your more skilled maths teachers can take classes with more able students, that would be a common approach to um, improve the provision across the piece. Um, so it's not, it's not a succinct answer, I appreciate that, but there is no, there's no one model that works more effectively, but very few schools will have a surplus of teaching assistants that are just sitting in the classroom supporting students anymore because they can't afford to operate in that way. But, but, but as far as teaching is concerned, uh, <coughs> it, I'm not sure that you've answered the question of a workload. Mm. Is it more, a, a, more of a, a workload to employ the teaching assistants and get them to do what you tell them to do, mm -hmm. uh, or, or to, to be in charge of the class and not have any teaching assistants? We didn't teach have any it, teaching Yeah, teaching assistants wouldn't reduce, te they wouldn't impact on teachers' workload in essence. Right. It, they would impact on the quality <coughs> of provision for the individual child. Um, 
it, potentially they, they may impact on workload in a small way in terms of providing differentiated resources for a particular student, but they're not likely to impact in any meaningful way on the amount of work the teacher still would have to do. So how many teaching assistants would uh, an average class have? An average class? Well, on average, none. Um, so there would be, the, it's, it would be, potentially you would have um, four or five teaching assistants in an average size school that would cover the, the whole remit. That's not too bad. <coughs> I, I got the impression that there that were lots of teaching assistants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's not, yeah. Several in each class. No, 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 no. no. Okay. Probably not in my whole teaching career, actually. <laughs> it's, been a, it's been a long time since there would have been, you might, there would have been a time where you might have a, um, an EAL coordinator in the class, so for where English is additional language and a teaching assistant supporting students. Um, there are far fewer students, only about 2% on average of students in schools have uh, what used to be called a statement, now an education healthcare plan, um, and it's only those schools that we get any kind of significant amount of funding for, so it would only be for those students that we would be required to put the in-class provision uh, or similar in there. For students who just have a general learning need, we can rarely support them with teaching assistance because of the, the funding cuts. Okay. 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 Uh, there's also, I, I should mention on that, um, the shift there you know, politically is around the, the code of practice. So the code of practice for special educational needs changed in, I think it was 2014, yeah. um, and the emphasis went very, very much from teaching assistance and external support and what you would kind of call wave two and wave three interventions to in-class teaching and, and the assurance actually that the most impact that you're going to make on the majority of students with learning difficulties is high quality first teaching in the classroom. Um, which none of us would disagree with, but it's obviously subject to all the other constraints that I've, I've already mentioned. Uh, is there another question? So I, I'm just, I was curious, yeah. you mentioned that you, you're looking at virtually 25% cut. Yeah. What, why is yours three times higher? And is there an appeals question. process? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a good question. Um, about 9 to 10% of that is coming from um, national cuts. Uh, the rest of that has come from the impact of uh, a change in role. So. Um, we, um, my school has gone through a fairly high period of turbulence for a few years um, and the result of that, the immediate result of that is student numbers drop for a short period of time. In essence it's not, it's not a very sustained period of time at all but the impact, because it's per student funding is now the significant majority of your budget, the impact of losing um, any students hits very hard on the money that you get coming in and it's lagged so you get that in arrears. So um, in essence I've come into a situation where the role fell uh, under my predecessor, uh, but that damage doesn't hit until a year later, so it hits my budget. Um, but then when that catches up a little bit, because the, the cuts in national funding are also so significant and moving all the time, um, that impacts on our school for a period of two to three years where we lose between 15 and 25% over the three years. Right. Thank you. Uh, okay. <coughs> I've already talked about that. Um, I thought it would be useful to share with you, um, this is the Association of uh, School and College Leaders. I did a survey to school leaders in January 2016 um, to get their views on how they feel funding cuts have impacted them. So I'll give you a minute or two to just look through some of those statistics so that you can get the perspective of uh, uh, leaders. Sorry, the slides? Yeah, 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 I can share those with you, that's fine, yeah. It's very noticeable, um, Tash, looking at question two, yeah. that it's very much like I believe the police were, where um, the government brought in community support officers as a cheaper alternative yeah. to support police, yeah. and then when funding cuts came, it was the community support officers that then got the job, yeah. the expensive policing, and that were protected by all sorts of contractors. But it's the same there, the biggest number of redundancies is at the bottom, and you can almost see an inverse pyramid. Yeah. The more people cost, the less likely they are to get thrown out, essentially, mm -hmm. to be hard, hard about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so support staff are most likely to lose, then teaching staff, then senior leadership. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, that, that's true. Um, I'd say something else that there's probably slightly masked there in question two. Um, I, I, I talked already about the difficulty in recruit, recruiting qualified teachers at the moment. Um, if you if you put an advert out um, for a uh, maths teacher's job, it will cost you several thousand pounds to put the advert out in any kind of wide audience. Um, you are unlikely to get any response. Certainly the, 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 where my school is placed geographically, I would get no response. I can guarantee it and I wouldn't waste my time spending the money on the advert um, because I'm not, in, uh, I'm not served well by public transport links. I'm not in a desirable part of London to work in. Working in London doesn't get you very much money at all in teaching in comparison to the, how that would work proportionately for other kinds of employment. Um, so you're only looking at a few thousand pounds more for the extra cost of living in London than you would get working in Hull or Birmingham or somewhere like that as a teacher. Um, and so consequently, there's no incentive really to apply for those jobs. So if I, uh, if I had the money, if I had money to offer and I'm looking for a maths teacher, I would almost certainly have to put a hefty price tag on it. I would almost certainly have to offer some leadership responsibility.